Once again, we've come to Trinity Sunday, so we'll take a look at the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. And in the time we've got for sermon, it's extremely difficult to do a good summary of this revealed mystery without falling into some sort of heresy. So in order to avoid that problem, we'll go over the same ground as before, in the first place because it's doable, and in the second place because it hasn't changed, and it never will. So anyway, before we get going, we have to remind ourselves the problem that we can have with our imaginations when we're talking about spiritual realities. We have to remember that our imaginations, because we have bodies, our imaginations, their job is to make pictures of material things. So you can picture a horse or an elephant or a pink elephant or a blue horse or whatever. We can picture them in our imagination. Those are changeable material representations of things. Those pictures, those material representations are found in our imagination. Ideas are not in our imagination. Ideas are in our intellect. Ideas like justice. What does justice look like? How big is it? What color is it? Love. Truth. These are ideas. These are unchanging spiritual concepts that are found in our intellect. Another example, we think we can think of trees. We can picture oak trees, palm trees, pine trees, a whole series of different trees. All those pictures are in our imagination. But treeness, the idea behind them, the thing that's common in all the different kind of trees that we can picture, that never changes. That's in our intellect. The images are in our imagination. Or weapons. We can think of tomahawks. You know, black powder rifles, uh, A-bombs, F-16s. We can go down a whole list of different things that are weapons. All those things can go on. Those images that we picture, as I say those words, like AK-47 or something, the image we get, that's in that's our imagination. But weaponness never changes. That's an idea, and that's in our intellect. Weaponness is a spiritual reality that never changes. But the images can because those are different particular uh, things okay anyway our imaginations make pictures of material things we've got bodies because many of our aspects of our faith are purely spiritual realities any image we make of those is going to be wrong when we make an image of an angel angels don't look like guys with white cassocks and wings that's a, just an image of a spiritual reality angels don't look like anything they're spiritual beings an angel is where it acts but it doesn't look like they can appear like that but they can appear like all kinds of things you know uh, St. John Bosco's angel would appear sometimes as a black lab you know angels can appear in all kinds of different ways but they don't have bodies so when they appear, it's how they choose to present themselves to us if they appear, okay? Anyway, our imagination can't help making pictures of spiritual realities because our imagination makes pictures, but we have to remind ourselves that it's wrong. Now, when we had geometry, when we were kids, we already learned this, although we might not know it. If you, when you started studying geometric points, and then you learned that a point doesn't take up any space, it doesn't have any spread, so you sharpen your pencil, you keep making little and littler dots, no matter how little the dot you are when you're a kid, you figure, boy, there's still some spread to it. After all, you figure out, I can't make a geometric, I can understand it, but I can't make a picture of the dad gum thing because no matter what I make, it's going to spread out. So I can have an idea of a geometric point, that exists in my intellect, but I can't draw one because it's just going to—it's going to have some spread to it. That's how it works. So we already know the image in my imagination of a geometric point, even if it's a little black dot and full of white space, perfectly white sheet of paper. The image is wrong, but I still understand the idea. Okay? So we already learned when we're kids we can understand a concept even when our image is, is wrong. The point is, is we can understand spiritualities with our intellect, but the image. And our imaginations can be wrong, so we don't want to allow ourselves to be misled. Our imagination can't depict spiritualities. It isn't meant to depict spiritualities, so we don't want to worry about it. Whatever it depicts, we just relax. It can't help it, but we don't worry. The most blessed trinity is the pure spirit. So any image we make of the most blessed trinity is always going to be wrong. But we don't want to worry about that and calculate off the image that we've created in our imagination. The most blessed trinity doesn't look like a shamrock, with all due respect to St. Patrick. And I'm not making fun of the great St. Patrick. I'm just saying, if we have an idea of the shamrock, we have to remember that is a shamrock. That's not God. And if the image is wrong. Okay, so we just don't want to confuse ourselves. Okay, this is the very hardest topic to preach on. 
especially because of the limited amount of time we have. So we're going to rely on St. Augustine's explanation of the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, and to do that, we're going to lean really heavily on Frank Sheep because he's so great. Okay, we're going to try to pack an explanation of this central mystery of our faith into about 15 minutes. Now, in seminary, we took a whole semester in this, and this was deep, and we're going to try to do this all in 15 minutes, so this is just going to be really flying over the surface. Okay, so we need to review these three terms once again. Mystery, nature, and person. And hopefully, these are starting to get hammered down. Mystery. When we talk about mysteries of our faith, what do we mean? One thing we don't mean is it's a mystery without a clue, like some murder mystery, you know, I mean, or something. We don't mean mystery in the ordinary way of speaking. Like, oh, well, nobody knows about that. It's pointless to even consider it. God didn't decide to reveal mysteries to us, like the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, so we could say, oh, well, mystery, let's not think about it. That is not the point of a mystery. A mystery of the faith is something that God explicitly wants us to think about, or he wouldn't have told us about it. He wants us to think about it. But the point of a mystery of the faith is, even when we think about it, even if we could think about it for all eternity, it's something that we're never going to be able to fully comprehend. He, the point is, he wants us to keep thinking about a mystery like the Holy Trinity, and we'll keep penetrating deeper and deeper into this mystery and get more and more insights. But even if we do this for all eternity, and please God we will, get to heaven. If we do that for all eternity, we'll still never be able to fully grasp it. Why not? Well, it's easy to see. On the one hand, we have this puny little finite intellect. On the other hand, we're trying to comprehend the infinite God. You can't get God inside your mind. If you, if you think you can, then whatever you're thinking about isn't God. Okay? So we can't get our minds around God. So a mystery of our faith is an inexhaustible truth. It's a truth that's inexhaustible. We can think about forever and ever and keep understanding more and more of and never get all the details. So that's mystery. Nature. Talked about this recently. Imagine we're staying in that cabin in the woods and late at night we hear some weird, crazy noise. And we wonder, what is that? Is that a coyote? Is it a mountain lion? Is it a grizzly bear? What is it? We ask the question, what is it? We're asking a question about nature's. Nature is a philosophical term. It's the whatness of something. Fish have fish nature. So they have gills, they swim through, they breathe water, they swim, okay? They act in a certain way. Birds have bird nature. They have feathers, they lay eggs, and so forth. We have human nature. Men have a body and a spiritual soul. We can walk and talk and laugh and think. In ordinary language, nature answers the questions, what is it and what can it do? What is it? What can it do? That's what a nature is. When we ask, what is it? What can it do? We're asking, what's its nature? Okay? That's nature. Person. Now imagine we're in that cabin in the woods and we hear a noise like this. We hear someone knocking at the door. We don't go, what is that? Is that a tree? Is that a grizzly bear? I mean, you know, when somebody says something like that, you know they've had a little too much brandy that night because you're not wondering. When you hear something knocking on the door, you say, who's there? Now, what's that? Start running. It, it'd be weird if you opened up the door and there wasn't anything there. You think, well, it'd, it'd give people the creeps, you know, and then you hear the horror music coming out. Why? Because we know that a person would say, who is it? We know it's a human being already, all right? We wonder who's there, not what's there, okay? Who's there? We already know it's someone with a human nature. When we ask a question, who... We're asking a question about persons. Nature determines what something is and what it can do. But person, that's who's knocking. That's who's doing a particular thing. Okay, let's take an example here. Uh, all of us here have human nature, except in a course for the angels and these stupid devils that are hanging out right now. Okay, so we're all different persons. Who am I? I'm Father Wolf, you know. All the abilities of a particular thing are determined by its nature, what it is and what it can do. We're men, so we can talk. Our nature doesn't talk. We talk. A person talks. I'm talking. Hopefully you're not. I'm talking. Okay, a particular person is doing it. The abilities of a particular thing are determined by its nature, but a person performs the actions. Okay? My nature isn't talking. I'm talking. Father Wolf, a person. You're sitting. You're listening. At least we hope so. Your nature isn't listening. You're breathing. Your nature isn't breathing. Okay, you're thinking. Your nature isn't thinking. A particular person is doing speaking, laughing, thinking, breathing. All these things are possible because we have a particular kind of a nature. But our nature doesn't do them, okay? Our nature doesn't do anything. We do something, a person, okay? One other important point. We don't ask, who is that? 
we see something like a new fruit or vegetable in the produce part of the city. You know, if somebody says, who is that? Why not? Because vegetables aren't persons. Neither are rocks, minerals, animals, huh? Dogs, carrots. These are not clouds. These aren't, uh, these aren't whos. Persons are different than that. Persons are a particular kind of whatness. Persons always have what's called a rational nature. A carrot doesn't have a rational nature. A dog doesn't have a rational nature. A cloud doesn't. Persons have a rational nature. A rational nature means it is a being that can know and it can love. A person can know and love. There are only three kinds of persons because there are only three kinds of persons that can know and love. There's men, there's angels, and there's God. Those are the three kind of beings that can know and love, the three kind of beings that have rational natures. So nature tells us what is it, what can it do. person tells us who is it, who's actually doing it. Nature tells us what is it, what can it do. person tells us who is it, who's actually doing it. A mystery is some inexhaustible truth that we can never completely understand. We can keep drawing more and more out of as we contemplate it. 